Eugenie, how are you doing? How are you? Thank Good. you so much for having Thank me. You. Thank you for coming out and talking with me. I appreciate it. I appreciate yeah. it. So I'm not going to hold you up. I'm going to jump right into it. Welcome to a Wild Tuna exclusive. For those tuning in, I'm here with Eugenia Kuzmina. Um, she's a superstar, model, actress, comedian, um, featured in a lot of films from Fury to films with Chuck Norris and a long list of things that we're going to get into. But first and foremost, thank you again for coming out. Thank you so much. I love how we have almost similar backgrounds. I know, I know. <laughs> it's matching. <laughs> it looks good. It looks good. So first thing first, um, so you're, you're born in Russia. Um, you, you come through and, and you've been through a lot in your life. So let's, let's talk about you personally and before you got to this point in your life, you know, give us a little background information. Um, you know, I grew up in food lines, so when the pandemic started in U.S., I was kind of prepared already mentally, I think, and it was interesting to see all the anxiety and how uh, I figured out the most important thing was to stay calm because, you know, growing up in food lines, it, it, it is a lot. Right. Um, so it was post-Soviet Russia. My dad was a scientist. He was a nuclear scientist, and he was one of the first responders to Chernobyl disaster right. in Russia and there were I don't know if you guys seen Chernobyl TV series on HBO it's a yeah. very interesting story um, so the government was suppressing a lot there was a lot of censorship and mm -hmm. my dad and Kurchatov my dad was the right hand of the main scientist you know they were trying to spread the word about their location and the you know how much it affected all the areas but Right. they were told to kind of limit it. So I think it really stayed with my dad's consciousness. And instead of storytelling about like Cinderella, I used to hear a lot of storytelling about like how you have to care about people and right. be compassionate and tell the truth. So I think it's really affected me as a child. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it taught me to be open-minded. I think my dad had a big influence, you know, in that sense. And we had nothing to do with like glamour or modeling so the fact right. that it finished there <laughs> it's very interesting yeah it's a, it's a major turn of events and, and and big congratulations on all your accomplishments definitely um, you too i appreciate that appreciate that so so tell me so what was your first um you know coming up in that environment and really understanding the value of family the value of pushing through and sticking together um how did that translate into, you know, your career when you were, you know, on your journey and testing the waters on being a superstar? Um, did your upbringing play a major part in, you know, make you making it through? I think it it's a personal journey for anybody, you know, and once it was really strange because I was thrown into the world of glamour and, you know, the brands and also as a model, you kind of you are there objectified and you're representing all these brands but you actually don't take them home you know so it's it it's like a facade in a way right. and i think it's really tough when you're a teenager especially to experience that because you don't really know and have the grounding of knowing who you are right. um and it took me some time i was very lucky because my first agent was natalie cross cotton who is the head of women agency in Paris. And she was really like a mother figure. You know, fashion can be very deceiving. It's very easy to divert from the path and go into clubbing and, you know, just having like an illusion of glamorous life. Right. There are always promoters who will call you. Everything is for free. But you have to understand, you know, they get something from that. They get something from like getting young models, you know, to be in the club and mm -hmm. attracting promoters. So I think my main uh, agent, my first agent really educated me about that. Right. I'm not saying that I didn't go through a lot of struggle. Like I had anorexia when I first started modeling because I wanted to compare myself to other, you know, models. There's always somebody. And also that, that you know, that's interesting because advertisement and so many messages teaches us to compare ourselves and be like other people. Right. Or, you know, strive for something. I think the most important thing is to strive to be your better self every day rather than mm -hmm. compare yourself to anybody else. I think your role model or icon is yourself. Right. Um, so it took me some time to learn. I had to go back home and um, kind of re-evaluate my values and not base 
any time or values or energy on the superficial world. Right. It became more like a job rather than, you know, everything that I would base my value on, which we can speak about. Like I, I talk to my kids about that in social media and anything that you have, like how many likes you have or right. <laughs> not saying like, thank you guys for coming. I'm sure, you know, it's like, it's so valuable and authentic. I think authenticity is a big part to do in this world. Definitely, definitely. Authenticity is what I preach and what I stand by. It's like, you know, it's the most natural thing you can do. If you want, ever want to follow and pursue any dream, any career, you always got going to it being yourself. It's way easier, you know, and you could be way more consistent that way. But uh, so, so let's, because you, you hit a lot of gems with that. You got, a, that was a lot of good information that you gave us. Um, so let's, let's talk about your first break into the industry. What was your first major accomplishment? It was a big surprise. You know, when I was 13, a lot of American companies and Western companies were coming to Russia mm -hmm. and they needed kind of girls to represent their brands. Of course, right. I didn't understand anything about the business at that point because it was mostly Soviet Union. It was propaganda. We had four channels, literally. <laughs> and um, there was no way to kind of have, you know, freedom of speech at that time. Um, and a lot of time I was punished in school for being creative. So I think that was kind of an avenue for me to mm -hmm. find my way out of school. <laughs> yeah. So you were being creative. So, so what, uh, well, like to, to explain that, like what, what happened? What did you do and what did your teachers, you know, were you like drawing or just Yeah, thinking? it was, it was the end of the eighties and beginning of the nineties. And, um, you know, I remember we had uniforms, you had to earn them. And mm -hmm. I saw some kind of an old fashioned magazine from my mom and they showed bikinis and I made a bikini out of my Soviet uniform. <laughs> so it was one of a kind that you were given and I had to apologize in front of the whole school for, you know, yeah. disrespecting the government. But I also saw the future in a way, I feel like, you know, um, something I, I saw it in the air I saw some things were changing so I wanted to you know I, I think being rebellious is part of the way of being a Capricorn maybe I don't know <laughs> but I, I always was rebellious as a child um, and also a lot of history books in Russia you know for 70 years it was communism so you were taught one narrative and right. then I kind of read through the lines and I would question my history teachers and they would beat us with like rulers and things like that and wow say like you can't ask certain questions so i think that taught me a lot about having your own intelligence in mm -hmm. life and kind of critical thinking right. uh, which was very helpful um and also like just expressing i think once i started modeling i learned a lot about advertisement and subliminal mm -hmm. messages and what it all means you know after i kind of stopped being anxious about fitting in i learned about you know what can i really bring to the storytelling and anything you do, no matter where you are, you know, you do films or TV or art, mm -hmm. you have to know what your message is and what's your intention and why you're doing it. Right, right. That's fact. So Chuck Norris, did you meet him personally? Oh, uh, well, yes, I didn't do a movie with him, like you said in the introduction, but I, I went really close. Basically, he hired me for the film when I was 13. Um, I had to play his daughter. He came to Russia and I think it was some kind of like an action thing. Uh, uh, of course, we didn't have a lot of people coming from the West, so I think he was one of the first, you know, um, big icons that we were advertised, you know, out there. Right. And uh, I was really excited, you know, I that was like a really creative opportunity. And then I never had a passport or any kind of visa to, mm -hmm. to go with a film schedule, so I couldn't do that. So that was like a no, completely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so with you know, with Russia at that time being so, um, you know, strict on freedom of speech and creative and things like that, was that like a conflict of interest? Like, could you have gotten tr in trouble for doing that film? For sure. I think, well, I think my family, basically my dad taught me to be in trouble and question certain things. I think he mm -hmm. was really my role model in that, you know. Right, right. Um, I knew that, you know, I, I could always get through if, 
I'll be smart. So, right. you know, I, I, I feel still like even now doing stand up and doing certain, you know, parodies and things like that in this age, you know, in America, like it, it definitely, it's not easy, you know, comedy, right. like you were censored so much. So I, I think it kind of stays for you. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, uh, we have a lot of freedom now in comedy, which is a good thing um, because it's, it's an exchange of information. And that's the best part about being a creative. You're able to express and influence people in ways where they can enjoy it on top of, you know, gaining information. So I definitely, definitely commend anyone who can put a smile on somebody's face and educate them at the same time. You know, it's major. So sure. let's, talk, let's talk about some more of your accomplishments because you got a nice long resume. You know what I'm saying? You got, you were uh, featured in a lot of fashion magazines. Um, so let's talk about maybe you got maybe a top two or top three magazines that you were featured in that, you know, you remember being a part of maybe your first major breakout. You could talk about that one. Um, you know, I think fashion is an interesting industry. And for me, it was always about being kind of part of the creation process, something else. It can become really self-centered right. and you know, your ego can go so high because you get paid so much money very fast, especially if you don't have your grounding. But I was very right. lucky after I survived my anorexia, uh, you know, and came back on the other side. It took me some time to find work. You know, sometimes as a model, you have to be really assertive with your presence. Right. And that's not something that we were taught. So I think I was a big extrovert and not somebody who would come into the room, you know, and be like, I'm here I am, I'm the center of attention. Right. You know, so I would hide in the corner and would be passed around for like other models who were more present. Mm -hmm. But then I met Yves Saint Laurent, who was a designer in Paris. Um, there's still a brand, but, you know, he passed away. And I just remember he kind of took a liking in me. I think we were very similar. So the first time I met him was like in a smoke, like in the smoke air. I couldn't quite see him. But he was so talented. Like his designs are just so perfect and, you know, right. visually speaking, so specific. And we did a show at, um, at the French stadium. In France, okay. soccer is a big deal. Right. So when soccer was combined with fashion, that was like a highlight of everything. You know, everybody was there, like Carlo Bruni and Claudia Schiffer and Naomi Campbell, you know, who was a huge influence on me. She came to Russia a lot of times before that. Right. Um, and that was a big break. And, you know, after that, I kind of moved to New York after a few years because that's the center of the business for any fashion industry, you know, right. anybody. Right, so, yeah. so yeah, that's major. East Saint Laurent, so that's pretty major. Um, and you had a long list of other uh, others, but that I could see why that was the number one right there. I can definitely see that. So let's talk about some of the influence that you had. Some maybe your top three influencers. Um, you know, not at all like glamorous designer you know somebody who would appreciate because a lot of time models they're waiting and fitting till like 3 a.m and they're sitting in a corridor on the floor it's not nothing that they present out in the glamorous fashion show so he was a huge influence mm -hmm. um obviously you know naomi like is a is an incredible person i think in the industry that guides so many models right. um and there were so many others that's awesome. So let's talk about your parents. Were were they, being as though they were rocket scientists, nuclear physicists, like they were a whole nother industry in the world. Um, did they support your, your dreams and your, your choice and career? It wasn't really a decision, you know, on their part because they lost my dad when I was 15. So I had to provide for my family. And I think uh, I, having a smaller sister, you know, I thought at least one of us can get education right, <laughs> right. because I was not so good at that anyway. So that was an easy choice. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, my mom is in Russia, but she comes to America sometimes. She's actually here. And okay. it's so funny because the mentality is so different. You know, she's always saying, why Americans smile so much? And I'm like, why Russians are so serious? <laughs> so it's a very, very different mentality. Um right. But, you know, I, I don't know. I think 
every culture has its own and you know family is something that is really important now like having three kids and right, right. pets <laughs> yeah oh yeah oh yeah the family life is so now you know working is it is it tougher for you to balance with you know having the kids and still you know being active in the industry or do you find an easy balance to handle that no it's never easy balance um especially now in 2020 when the kids are on zoom and that's why i'm hiding in my closet this is just like a big <laughs> wall behind, <laughs> behind that is chaos that's the only quiet place and i think my therapist is still asking me like why like you're in your closet it's your safe space what does it mean <laughs> <laughs> it's been funny <laughs> for sure but sure. you know i we try to get through humor and also i find we adopted some pets during this pandemic like my daughter loves birds she wants to be a veterinarian okay. which i'm really happy she doesn't want to be in hollywood or anything fancy like that she really cares about you know environment and that's really important right. so yeah it's not easy you know, we yeah. try to do our best. I learned a lot about asking for help and not being perfect. There's so much expectations mm -hmm. for parents right. or for your person to always be like on top, you know, and you just push through and fail and then you joke about it. So right. that's, that's how it is. Long, long as you get through it, that's all it's about getting through it. Exactly. <laughs> so so let's talk about um, the movie Fury. You were, you were featured in that film also. Um, that was one of the long on one of the lists that you had there. Um, how did that come about and how was that experience? came for the end of watch. I think that's one of my favorite films that he's done about, you know, just like the streets and um, He's an interesting artist. He did Suicide Squad and, you know, the, I, I think one of my favorite artists is Shia LaBeouf mm -hmm. on that film because he was so committed. He would like almost mm -hmm. take his tooth out and, you know, be on top of it. Uh, they shot in England and um, it, it, it's about war, you know, but I think I always look to work with directors who portray some things and they go beyond that and make it very authentic. Right. And, they they will bring all the artists to live in trenches for like four weeks and then you kind of can really feel right. it. Yeah, yeah, that's the you really gotta be dedicated when it comes to acting. You gotta fully indulge. So anyone who's can do that successfully, I know this is not the easiest thing. And I know the process of making a movie is it takes sometimes years, you know, and you're shooting the same thing over and over again. And you do your own stunts. So let's for talk, sure. let's Let's talk about you doing your own stunts. That's major. Yeah, you know, it's really fun. I think I think it's important to, to be authentic, right? Like if you can portray right. something. I'm really excited to work with Terran Tactical. They're working currently on, um, you know, on Matrix, I think, and also John Wick. They're incredible uh, because I think it's important. It's so easy to like pretend that you're Russian and you speak gibberish, right? You have to actually speak the language. I think it's so important to storytelling. Right. So they really teach you stunts. You guys can check him out. He's based in LA, but I think, you know, you can work with them like digitally as well now. Mm -hmm. um, so we worked on that for Spy City. There's a TV show that's coming out with Dominic Cooper that we did all about spies. And I had no idea that, like this was my first one, that everything that's glass is made out of sugar. And if you break like any kind of glass bottle, it's basically sugar. Uh, but I think it was the first one for Dominic <laughs> Cooper as well. He's like, I don't want to break your neck, you know, because it looks like sugar <laughs> <of> glass. <laughs> so, it's interesting. It's definitely very different from martial arts. I worked with Sam Hargrave, who did Hunger Games, who has the film Ec Extract on Netflix right now. It's one of the best action, uh, like action sequences you can see, I think, in 2020. If you check it out, they shot in India. And one of the sequences is just so well orchestrated. Uh, we shot a film called Game Changer. And you know, I practiced my sounds for a month, probably a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and he did also Atomic Blonde, like all the sequences that you guys seen on the stairs falling over. It's definitely more of a dance. You don't hit anybody and you have to know how to be like camera left, camera right. So there's a lot of brain activity as well right. that's going like once you do it. And hopefully you won't 
kick anybody for real. <laughs> uh, yeah, so currently planning to do a film with Bruce Willis um, mm -hmm. and planning to do the stunts. We started rehearsing, but it got postponed, I think, to January. Still waiting, you know, there's a few projects that they can't quite get insurance as of now, but very hopeful, you know, and keep practicing. Right. It's really fun, yeah. <laughs> That's that's great. That's great. So when when you decided to say, you know, I'm gonna do my own stunts, was there any stunts that you were like, maybe I shouldn't have did this, maybe I maybe I, you know, dived in too quick? <laughs> yeah, I think motorcycle, you know, yeah. it took me two years to pass the license. Thank God the film was postponed, but I was <laughs> like, I can do a motorcycle, I can arrive, you know, on the scene, just be yeah like every action hero, but then, you know, when you actually drive a motorcycle, it's such a skill and you have to have the license. So there's a lot, you know, that goes into it. And thank God people really protect, you know, you from getting the license. So you have right. to <laughs> really pass it. But I found this really great uh, place in LA. It's called West Side Moto. And okay. it's two sisters who started the school and you can pass your test in two days basically if you do it from morning to night but then you have to go to dmv and you know get like a second evaluation right. so that was interesting i definitely felt off the motorcycle a lot and actually my trainer in the first day he's like well anybody who is like unstable or shaking i'll have to stop you and you you have to restart the course so i had to walk the sh walk of shame and uh, you know, <laughs> It's all good. It's all good. But everything came out great. Um, yeah. Hopefully, got the license. <laughs> yeah, right. I was about to say, hopefully you you staying on the bike these days. You're not falling off. You still riding? Uh, well, not really. You know, I think with the kids, it's a little bit dangerous. I think now everybody's so agitated. So the way, you know, people drive in LA is very emotional. Yeah. And I... Yeah. I kind of, <laughs> you can feel it. I yeah. kind of keep it for, you know, the movie set where it's more regulated. Right, yeah, yeah. The LA traffic is different. LA traffic and New York traffic. Some of the worst traffic I've ever been in. For um, sure. Yeah, New York. definitely off the road on the bikes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you were, you're some other films that you were featured in um, that I want to talk to you about. Um, there's a, one that a lot of people have got I've watched giving a lot of uh, a great report about, and that's Bad Moms. So uh, let's give it, let's talk to us about Bad Moms. How'd you get that situation rolling? And, you know, anything that crazy happened on the site or on the yeah. set? You can share. Yeah. Well, basically, my pitch was to the director I'm already a bad mom. You don't need to audition <laughs> me. So that's how I got it. I didn't have to audition for it. Honestly, I sent them the picture of like us being covered in paint and my kids were really young and it was a mess. Right. And, uh, you know, since like a lot of times people want to work on set with somebody they worked before, somebody they can trust. So it's a very small circle uh, mm -hmm. of people. And, you know, obviously it was interesting to go on that set. We didn't know what's going to happen because we didn't know a lot of people. Right. Uh, but it was also fantastic because a lot of people, a lot of girls were mothers. Mm -hmm. And they knew what it takes. So there was no, what I really love, there was no arguments over trailers. You know, we were shooting in New Orleans, which is such an amazing city. I just really fell in love with that. You yeah. know, the whole culture, the restaurant, the music, like the roots. Right. It was incredible just to explore that and be there. And also being part of that set, you know, I think uh, the directors did a great job. They did a hangover before. So mm -hmm. they obviously very skilled in comedy. And... Right. You know, it was great. I think Mila Kunis, she just had a kid and we had a lot of funny jokes. They called me, it, it was a really bad joke, really like, you know, kind of hard jokes, but they worked. I think it works sometimes. It's just like flow. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that, there's nothing wrong with it. We like that over here in America. So keep it rolling. We appreciate your Start work. Definitely, definitely enjoying it. So give us, give us, um, the craziest thing that happened on any of your movie sets or maybe some of your fashion shoots, maybe a crazy story or something that went wild or went wrong. Give us a good one. Uh, there's so many crazy stories. I mean, I told the story before, so I'm not sure if you guys heard it, but um, basically I was fired from my first set, uh, mm -hmm. one of my first sets. So I got a job with Zac Efron on this film. Um, 
in New York and I was, I was kind of entitled, you know, when, once it, which taught me a lot of lessons. Um, you know, once you get a certain recognition and things in one field, you think that every, like you have all the skills for the other fields. Right. You basically don't go, want to go down the grade and like start with an acting class and things like that. So I got this job and like, I'm really happy they fly me to New York. I feel like usual, you know, they put me in this hotel. I don't memorize my lines. Like I don't do anything. I'm right. supposed to play bartender. I'm just ready. You know, like everything is like, just come and shoot me. Right. And, um, <laughs> I started breaking glasses, like I had no idea how to bartend and I was disrupting the whole set schedule and it was very, very cold and the whole film is based like in summer in New York. So all the actors and the crew were freezing, they were tired, our scene was shooting after midnight and we started shooting and at some point, like take five or six, Zach is like, I'm sorry, like we have to move on. Like there's no time for, for you to be here yeah. and I was really upset. So it was the last day of the shoot for the film and they had a um, closing party afterwards and I decided to show up on the closing party and I'm like, I know how to bartend. So I'm gonna go behind the bar and start making drinks. Right. So I went to this fancy like club, you know, doing drinks for everybody in the crew, like just trying to prove them, like we have to shoot it and right. put me back in the scene only to be arrested by two bodyguards in front of Zac Efron and the director. <laughs> like literally, that was like the worst thing that can ever happen. To walk me out of the club and say I'm not allowed there because I didn't have a license to be a bartender. Oh wow, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that, I think that taught me like a really humble lesson, a really humility lesson that it's never about you. Like no matter where you are, it's always about the story. It's always about other person. And I'm so grateful that it happened in the beginning, you know, rather than like, sometimes I think for some actors, it happens, you know, just because they started young and they had no idea. And, you know, so that was an interesting story. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I like that. So since we got a bad one, we got to keep it balanced. So give us the best experience you had in your career. What was one of those top things where you're like, this goes on the list of I needed that in my life. <laughs> you know, I I feel like that every day, to be honest with you. It's really hard to point one thing. I think every day I wake up and I'm so grateful. Um, talking about 2020, uh, recently I did this commercial with uh, this product, it's called Claire. Um, mm. And I, I was just grateful to be on set, to be honest, because after not being on set for such a long time, just being around humans and having interaction and connection right. it meant a lot it doesn't matter what you do but just being creative being mm -hmm. safe obviously but still having that life connection it, right. it, it means a lot right yeah i have that too it's like i i love i miss concerts i miss you know doing all the you know the outside stuff even just you know studio sessions you know i'm an engineer producer so just mm -hmm. having people you know coming in out of the studio again is going to be a, a nice, a nice, you know, reflect, or, I mean, not reflect, a nice change of pace because we know we need interaction with people. We need that. It helps the creators grow. It helps us learn and experience. So hopefully, you know, we can get through this thing sooner than later. I'm pretty sure, you know, it will be definitely a renaissance, especially in music because yeah. everybody's starving. So anything that you write right now, it will explode. I can feel it. We're doing a little bit of shows here and there with social distancing, you can get crowds, you know, like you, you use the music and you kind of thrive on that energy. Right. But we're trying the best. Right, right. Well, keep striving, keep pushing. I'm a big fan. You got me. I'm a you supporter. Too. Anything you guys need, just let us know, you know, we'll, we'll hold it down on this side for you guys. So anything else, you know, you want to share with the people, um, you know, want to leave them with some words of encouragement and let them know where they can find you and your work. Well, I can see a few friends here. So thank you guys. I'm so happy to, to see you. And so thank you for your time. I think time is value. Right. Um, it's everything, you know, and I hope that you, you take care of your family and, and hope we all can stay creative and, you know, like keep creating every day and be grateful for that. Right. Definitely. Definitely. So stay creative, stay close to family. You know, push love, stay positive, and I appreciate you, Eugenia, for coming out on a Wild Tune exclusive. Mm -hmm. So we'll definitely be in touch.
keep pushing, keep striving, and keep accomplishing. And I'm definitely proud of you for everything that you've done so far and everything you've been through. You too. Thank you so much for having me. And I can't wait to maybe do a concert together or something. Like come Definitely. In concert. Definitely. We're going to talk about it. I'm, I'm going to shoot you a DM. We're going to talk. We're going to plan some business. Okay. Discussion. Let's do it. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Well, Thank night. you, guys. Get back to the family. I'll let you get out the closet. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I hopefully I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Shout out to Eugen Eugenia Kuzmina. Very accomplished, very accomplished, still working. Great interview. It's a wild tuna exclusive. Shout out to our sponsors, drippyfish.com, results and no hype.com, radio pushes TV. And you know, shout out to my home team, man. Fresh Elite, everybody out there working. Y'all stay positive, stay safe, you know, social distance, use your hand sanitizer, do what you gotta do but keep being creative and love your family. Peace, y'all.